Thank you so much for today's talk. Uh, my name is Pranav. I'm a law student from Calcutta and I live in Bombay. And it was a very fascinating talk. My question is that uh, with regard to Kumar Jeeva's lessons and teachings, how do we contextualize it in uh, redefining Indo-China relations 2.0? Is it relevant? How do we use it? Thank you. Kumar Jeeva is a cultural ambassador. Yes? Kumar Jeeva is a cultural ambassador. And I am very firmly believe that we should use culture because nobody, there is no one who does not like culture. Uh, no, anyway, even those who do not like it will never admit it. Uh, it is a, it's a because they look stupid, you know? If you are against culture, you, you look stupid, really. So you, you, everybody likes culture. Also, culture is not confrontational, you know? We all, we, we all, we all are interested in culture, in Chinese culture, in Indian culture. So, Kumarajiva is a very fine example uh, of a cultural ambassador between India and China, just like Xuanzang is, and just like so many others are. But I just mentioned the two most important ones. So, for his contemporary relevance is a cultural ambassador. How is it that the Silk Route can strengthen all this, including Kumar Jiva? The Silk Road and? Strengthen this, bringing up, highlighting what has been done in the past, Kumar Jiva and possibly Well, after. Hmm. first of all, Silk Road, it's a German word. Oh, no. no. Silk Road is not a Chinese word. No. Silk Road is not an Indian word. Silk Road, it is some German von Richthofen who who came up with the word, this is an Seidenstraße, and then everybody started translating that, and now it's so common that everybody forgot where it came from. It seems it's, uh, it's so Chojo Lu is Chinese, yes, but it's actually a translation. So Silk Road, is, that's that about the origin of the word. Then there is no really one Silk Road, there's only a network of many roads. Uh, also, by, there is a maritime road by sea, mainly from South China, from Guangzhou, Foshan, to stay Buddhist, to uh, via Southeast Asia, Malay, Malay Peninsula, passing Thailand, where I'm now, then going to Southeast India and to Sri Lanka. That's also a very important road. There is an important road from uh, from the Bay of Bengal to Burma, along the Irrawaddy and the Salween River, Nujiang in Chinese, going to Yunnan and going on to Chengdu, to Sichuan. This, so there, there are so many interesting roads called Silk Road. So uh, this, uh, you should really specify in Kumarajiva is important for the continental road. The continental road and specifically this northern one. The southern one, as you have seen on the map, goes to Kotan, to Kashgar, or from Kotan down to Gandhara. Uh, this, uh, and the, the northern one, that's Kucha, that's, and Kumarajiva is to be located there. That's what's going to be revived, isn't it? That's, isn't that what is going to be revived? Was it ever dead? Well, no, but I mean culturally it <laughs> Yes, was. I, I know what you mean, madam. I'm just being mean in my reply. <laughs> <laughs> excuse me. Excuse me for that. Excuse me for that. But the, the Silk Road has uh, really always been very central. In all, you can see it in many museums around the world. It's uh, cent Silk Road study centers, Central Asian study centers. You see it so many. So, but now there is a new dimension added to it. Yes. I mean, it's nice to know that Sanskrit was so prominent, even we don't know that much about it in Kashmir. Uh, and it would be nice to revive that before, uh, before Persian came there. Yes. Yes, Kashmir is a center for Buddhist studies, but it does not come into Buddhist history before the second century AD. Kashmir becomes Buddhist in the second half of the second century AD. So it was not really on the Silk Road. The Silk Road goes 
just like if you take the bus today in Kashgar, in the Chinibag Hotel, all right? I've done it one time. Take a bus and go to the border, to Tashkurgan. And then you cross to, over to Gilgit. You go past through the Swat Valley. Don't do it right now, it's not safe. <laughs> because there are very many unhappy people along that road. So don't do that. But it used, uh, some time ago I've taken the bus. So it, you could do that. That is really the, a silk road. It, it crosses the Karakorum Mountains and goes down to Gandhara, to Pakistan. That is, that is, but it didn't go to Kashmir, really. Kashmir comes late, later, during the Kushanas. Well, so many interesting things. Thank you very much. How come Indologists like D.D. Kosambi, uh, he, I've not read his entire work, but whatever I've read of his works, how come he never mentions or, uh, I mean, I've never seen Sanskrit uh, given an upper hand over Pali because most of the literature or text uh, which are found during that reign or the region, uh, because Pali was a language of the common people, right? So how come this upper hand thing came up. I mean, how is it that Kumar Jiva translated only Sanskrit works and Because not there was only Pali. Sanskrit. You know, but uh, wasn't it only the language of the elites? Uh, I mean? you know, as Indians, you know that the Gupta dynasty was a Sanskrit dynasty. That's, it started in 319. Yes? That's when Chandra Gupta got on the <laughs> throne. So in, in 319, and then it becomes Sanskrit. Sanskrit was not only the language for the the Gupta dynasty, it was a cultural phenomenon all over, also for Buddhism. So in the fourth century, Sanskrit beca became the Buddhist language. As for Pali, let me say a few things, just very briefly, yes? In 1954, 1954, there was a Japanese scholar who said that from Pali there are four translations to, to Chinese. He said there is the Vimuttimaga, there is the Dhammapada, there is the Atakavaga of the Sutanipata, and there is the Samantapasadika, he said. And, but I'm sure he changed his mind. He lived to be a hundred. <laughs> and so he, because scholars can change their mind, you know, and then they write something different. It's, uh, so when you ever look at the work of a scholar, look at the latest publication not what he wrote 30, 40 years ago. Well, you can do that too, of course. But the most recent information is that. Now, today, in 2015, the more and more people, including myself, are convinced that not even one Chinese text was translated from Pali. The Vimutti Maga, no, it was Vimukti <laughs> Marga. It was, it was not from Pali. The, even the, the Dhammapada, the Dharmapada, the Venerable Dhamma Jyoti has shown that the original Indian language was almost Pali, but it was not Pali. The same applies to Atakavaga of the Sutanipada. The Samantapasadika, even a long time ago, a French scholar said the base, this Chinese text looks like a prototype of the Pali. Means it was not the Pali, yes, if it's a prototype. So this now, it, not from the Pali. So I'm always, uh, I know why Pali is so strong in this country, because they have strong convictions and it was reintroduced, Buddhism was reintroduced by Pali people. Jagdish uh, Kashap, for instance, uh, and they were, had their training in Sri Lanka and Thailand. Uh, that's true, so that's the reason. There are other reasons. But believe me, the basic Indian language for Buddhist studies is, ever since Kumara Jiva, Sanskrit. And even before him, you find some Sanskrit, like Ashvagosha, Buddha Charita, everybody knows that was Sanskrit. In the end of the second century in Kashmir, a new orthodoxy, Sarvastivada orthodoxy was established in Sanskrit. So even before Kumara Jiva, you have Sanskrit pockets and individuals. But, but in the f 
with from in the fifth century the common language was Sanskrit and it has never changed. Okay, but how come then uh, we have all these evidences that uh, uh, Ashoka sent you know his son and his uh, daughter yes. to different countries and yes. they propagated the, lang the, the religion in Pali. How is it that they did not use Sanskrit if it was if it were you know no, prominently? The, the, in, uh, uh, the, uh, the Buddhists always, in the ancient days, used the local language. Just as I said, uh, Gandhari in the Gandharan area, yes? They used other brackets in other Indian areas. The, the Buddhists at the beginning always used the local colloquial spoken language. Buddha did not have anything against Sanskrit, but he did not have anything for it. You know, uh, it was just a, like Ashwagosha could write Sanskrit, why not? So this, uh, everybody was using his own Prakrit. But ever since 400 AD, the general language for all the Buddhists had become Sanskrit and stayed Sanskrit. I, I, I urge many Indians who are Buddhist scholars to study Buddhist Sanskrit and Chinese because all of Chinese Buddhism from Kumaraji, Vashu and Zhang is Sanskrit based. So how, and study, please do study Chinese, you know, because in China you have much more, the literature in Chinese is so vast, that, and, and in India you have already lost it. You don't even know it exists, but it exists in Chinese translation. So even as an Indian, if you want to know more about your own culture, you need Chinese to do that. It's, uh, I, in China, I often say you learn so, man, so much from India, now it's time to give back. You know, uh, they forgot about it and now you should give back what you have gotten from India. So the Chinese have a motive to give back to India and the Indians have a reason to study the Chinese. And, here again, I'm coming back to the contemporary angle to the whole subject. Thank you sir, very much. I understand the best Hindi that is speaking, spoken in Delhi is in Chinese uh, embassy. And I think uh, they can translate all these uh, works that is in China about Buddhism. I think some uh, Chinese scholar should take it up and translate it in Hindi. So I think that will be a better cultural relation between the two countries. I know that in, uh, in China, there's the interest in India is much greater than in India, the interest in China, largely speaking, yes. Many more scholars in China study India, and one of them is my very good friend in Peta, Wang Bangwei, who is a GCN Lin, uh, disciple, he will retire very soon. So if you want him in, please hurry. He will retire very soon. So he's a, many, many, many Indian, many Chinese scholars are really interested in, in Buddhist studies and in India. And it's when they see an Indian in China, I always, I ask my Chinese friends, is, is he an Easterner or a Westerner? And they always reply, a Westerner. He comes from Xi, right? He's a Westerner. And then I ask why. And then they say, Can, can't you see? <laughs> and then they say, and his, he probably knows all about Buddhism, you know? But when they see an Indian, they automatically assume he knows Buddhism. Buddhism is, is a ideal for cultural exchange. I could give another lecture, I won't do it. Don't, don't, don't be afraid. <laughs> <laughs> but Buddhism is the international dimension of both Chinese culture and Indian culture. You know, uh, if you, the Chinese culture is Confucianism, that's Yang. Taoism, that's Yin. So you don't need anything anymore. But you need an international dimension, and that's Buddhism. Indian culture, the same. In the, I cannot go into the holiest place in a Vishwanath temple, in the Durga temple in Benares, they don't let me in because I don't look Indian. Uh, so how can this, that be a world religion? You know? The international dimension of Hindu religion, of Hindu culture, 
is Buddhism. Uh, and so this, that's why Buddhism is so excellent for the cultural in exchange. It's not confrontational. If you, if you meet a confrontational Buddhist, he's not a real one. <laughs> They're not confrontational. Uh, and you can use the culture for the cultural exchange. And, you so, and China can learn from India, India can learn from China in that way. And this is, a, this is the main lesson I would bring today. Thank you.